So I've read the docs, um, you know, just simply adding like next providers for authentication, like Facebook, GitHub, you know, name it, works very, very smooth. That's a great update for ShotCN. Yes, this ma makes me want to create a new dashboard side yeah. project. What it does, it is supposed to cut off all the memoization kind of tasks for us developers and handle it via the, the compiler, which sounds very promising, but... So before I start, could you do us a quick favor and subscribe to our channel if you find this content useful? It is much more important than you may think. With the bigger channel, we'll be able to invite the top voices from the web development community and provide you with the best content and the in-depth tech talks. Thank you and enjoy watching the episode. Hello guys, welcome to the next episode of the Next Gen Web Podcast. Today we have three interesting topics, which is ShotCN with the new update, the AuthJS and also the React compiler. So let's start with the first topic, which would be the ShotCN. So basically, ShadCN introduced a new kind of charts update, but I guess we can simply start by providing some information what ShadCN basically is. I know we covered ShadCN previously, but just so that we are on the same page with the listeners, we can briefly introduce what ShadCN really is. Sure. So let's start uh, with the information that ShadCN is actually a user and he created his own UI library, which is ShadCN UI. Uh, it introduces us to a set of components uh, that are pretty much customizable and based on Radix uh, primitives, which uh, focus on accessibility. And with this library, we have a new update, which is focused on uh, charts and uh, components around charts. Um, so what do you think about that? Yeah, sure. Maybe just before we dive like into the charts, we can kind of distinguish the main difference between the traditional kind of um, components package, which would be, for example, the Mantine or the Material UI, which is very common. Uh, basically, the main difference is um, in the ShotCN approach, you own your components, which means you are not uh, creating a next dependency to your project. You are simply copying the code of the components straight to your code base, um, which has both advantages and disadvantages uh, as everything pretty much. Um, but what it gives you is the full control over the components and also um, creates uh, like a great uh, separation of concerns between the component logic and the styling of the components. Uh, thanks to which you can simply make your own uh, kind of components library from scratch uh, with ShadCN, which is great. And uh, as you mentioned, uh, ShadCN came up with the new charts update, uh, which basically uh, is being built on top of free charts, uh, which is the go-to JS library to make charts. Um, but the thing that stands out uh, is the way just how simply it is implemented and you know the looks of the charts uh, when i first saw the tweet uh, about the new charts update i was like man i gotta use it like it looks so smooth like to be honest uh, this is the the go-to solution for charts right now i would say and uh, the api seemed uh, very simple to get um, so yeah, I would think that's a great update for ShotCN. Yes, this ma makes me want to create a new dashboard side yeah, project. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. Charts. Yeah, for sure. Uh, yeah, that's 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 really great, and I hope I will use it in near future. It looks really promising for me. And the second thing we would like to talk about is the new update uh, to AuthJS, which is also known as Next Alf, but right now they are more. Uh, known as uh, AltJS and uh, more focused on different frameworks than n not only Next.js. Sure, yeah, the naming came out great, to be honest, because like I was pretty confused before, because like I believe they also supported uh, other frameworks. Uh, so basically, changing the name to AltJS, which is very simple to um, you know to remember, uh, is great. And also, it was kind of the go-to standard with implementing the authentication to Next apps, I believe. 
Uh, so if you think about you know just doing the authentication in Next.js app, you will simply think Next app. I was like the you know the yes. basic the, the gold standard. Um, so basically, they kind of rebranded to um, you know target more frameworks, but also um, they have a pretty big update with the tool that is supposed to boost your productivity as a developer, which is the Outjs CLI. Yes, that's true. So right now we can uh, speed up our authentication uh, development process with this CLI tool. I haven't used it myself, only saw the, the thread on X about this. And it looks really promising, but maybe you can share us a little bit more. As yeah, I know sure. So we actually talked about it before the episode. I was uh, trying to use the new AFJS CLI. And I use it uh, both in the Next.js Turbo Pack version and also the traditional Next.js. And uh, I just kind of uh, couldn't uh, get it going. But we have to note here that it's a very fresh thing. Um, I'm pretty sure it came uh, came out like two weeks ago, maybe. Yes, so it is yes. very new. Um, also, I've read the docs. Um, you know, just simply adding n like next providers for authentication like Facebook, GitHub, you know, name it, um, works very, uh, very smooth. And just, you know, being able to do the old stuff that you would have to like kind of create the boilerplate, you can simply do via CLI, which is very handy uh, for the productivity. And uh, yeah, that's cool that they actually did it because uh, to be honest, the CLI tools are always a good boost of productivity in projects. Yeah, that's true. Uh, the same thing goes, uh, for example, in my case with uh, typing for Superbase, for example. Oh yeah, sure. It's, it's also really helpful. So another CLI tool will be, after they a little bit improve that, it will be, it will sure. be great. Sure, uh, like you've also mentioned Superbase. I've also seen that uh, besides the app providers, you can also uh, spin up the database uh, providers. Yes. Um, so Superbase is one of them. Um, I'm personally a very big fan of Superbase. Uh, I've used it in uh, used it in one of my projects, and uh, just the simplicity, and uh, you know, being able to uh, like have a Postgres, good old Postgres SQL, uh, and you know, all the features around with Superbase is great. So that's a, that's a very handy tool as well. And uh, yeah, the CLI looks very promising. So we're going to see how it turns out in practice. And I guess we can kind of move to the next topic, which is uh, the React compiler. That's true. So in the new version, that was uh, one of the hottest topics, I would say, the React comp compiler. Uh, what it does, it is supposed to cut off all the memoization kind of tasks for us developers and handle it via the, the compiler, which sounds very promising. But yes, so there is a but here, right? So there's always a but. Yeah, so we should also talk about the kind of the usage of the compiler. As for now, we have to also keep in mind that it's very new. So of course, everything is not going to you know work out of the box. Yes. But we can kind of discuss uh, what is the current state of the React compiler as for now. Almost all of this is still like in work in progress stage. Yeah. Uh, first of all, we have to also get to know what it like what this compiler should do. So also the code name for this is React Forget because they want us to forget about things like memoization, hooks like use callback, use memo. Um, and right now we have it in open source. We can uh, check the code for it. We can test it out for ourselves. It's pretty easy to set up and it's working, but it's working right now with very simple cases. Like we have some documentation about it. And if we copy um, examples from the documentation into our IDE and try to run it, then React compiler right now is great. It works almost as perfectly as it would be with great performance uh, without React compiler. Um, but the issue arises when we are creating more advanced applications, then it uh, optimizes only a part of our components 
Um, so, for example, if we have 10 components that would need co uh, optimization in a, in a bigger, more, more complex application, compiler catches maybe two or three o of them, which is also not a terrible score, but we can see that this is still a beta version. This is still work in progress and React team will be working on uh, improving that. Yeah, so I believe we basically read the same article uh, regarding the React compiler. Uh, which like covered the basic usages, which worked perfectly. It was like kind of a magic, you know, you just forget about the mem memoization. But as you said, the problem arises when we have some more complex apps. And I would say, you know, just the process of memoization of the React apps, overall the performance, um, is a very complex topic and you are not always achieving the best possible performance just by wrapping the component in the React memo or just you know wrapping the, the function in the use callback. I would say some of the problems can be actually tackled by stuff like React Composition for example. So you know just moving the component like further down in the uh, component tree or uh, for example, passing the component as a children, you know. So there are many ways to achieve the better performance and it requires from us developers more like abstract thinking and just, you know, coming up with some solutions that not only are based on the simple use memo, use callback react memo. Uh, so that is why this is very hard task to achieve actually for the React compiler just to, you know, uh, ensure that all of the cases which should be memoized are actually memoized. So um, even though we have like uh, two out of ten, I would say this is quite a you know big uh, breakdown uh, in the React world, which looks promising. Uh, but as for now, uh, we should still you know be able to uh, use the, all the memoization hooks, you know, uh, just to ensure the best possible performance in the apps. That's true. The one thing I'm concerned about is right now the whole, let's say, optimization and performance improving tasks are on us developers and we can, we have huge control over it. Uh, so if we do a good job, then the performance will be high and if we do a bad job, it will be lower. But with such tool as React Compiler, it can be an advantage because we don't have to think and remember about some of these things. But the disadvantages, uh, the disadvantage is that it also adds a new layer of abstraction between us and uh, the new black box in the app. Yes, so and, yeah, and we, we, we don't have direct control over it and how uh, the React Compiler will treat uh, specific components. So as with these examples, it only um, optimizes two out of 10 uh, components and yeah. eight of them are unoptimized and maybe a developer would catch more of them. Sure, so I would say as for now, like it doesn't uh, like um, give you the freedom to not uh, just use memoization at all. Even I would say that you have to be even more like uh, conscious and aware where you should use the optimization, you know, just uh, manually without uh, relying on the React compiler. So um, that is a tool we should like, you know, use and uh, see how it turns out in the future. But also the like, you know, the knowledge of the memoization hooks and overall, we have to keep in mind that the overall React performance and the re-rendering, uh, you know, strategies are not only about the memoization hooks, but also, as I said before, the you know just overall decomposition and the architecture of the projects, because in many cases, you know, the need for memoization can you know come from the bad architecture from your app. So we have, for example, a component higher in your component tree, which causes the re-renders and whole waterfall of re-renders uh, comes to the end of the component tree. So basically, that is just the bad architecture. So we should keep in mind. Uh, to you know, just take advantage of the React composition and uh, you know, just trying to uh, like do a, the best architecture possible, but also being able to you know, memoize the stuff on our own. Yeah, that's true. I think a golden solution would be to, for example, turn on this uh, React forget 
by default, but leave the door open for uh, developers who would like to tweak some things on their own and uh, have some experimental flag that, hey, I would like to optimize my components on my own and I don't want any, any of this uh, React forget stuff going on. Yeah, sure. Uh, because the, the one thing I'm personally wor worried about is the state of um, React where so many things are abstracted out of developers' hands that new developers won't uh, learn like programming principles and um, optimization basics, but would rather just go for the available tool and then won't be able to handle more specific cases because this React Forget React Compiler won't be uh, probably enough in all of the cases. And sometimes exactly. yeah. you will need some tweaking. Just like with SHA-CN components, sometimes you need to go into this file and change some things regarding layout or, or other things. So I think we as developers need to keep our skills with uh, problem solving and optimization stuff and not let uh, abstraction do all sure. of our work. Yeah, exactly. And just imagine the case where, uh, for example, the compiler uh, like breaks something, uh, like memoizes something that it shouldn't do, should memoize, and just you know the hassle of debugging those things in such a black box where you don't have such control seems a bit scary for me. Uh, so that you know, like, kind of uh, puts an exclamation mark on you know just having the knowledge of the performance and not relying only on the abstraction, as you said. Yeah. Yeah. So that's the the main take on the React compiler. Uh, also, as for today, as we are recording this episode, uh, we've talked uh, about it briefly before recording, uh, is the whole CrowdStrike situation. I just, you know, looked up in Google not to, you know, mispronounce the, the word. Uh, but as for now, it seems to be like huge all over the world. Like the, the Microsoft devices, which were relying on CrowdStrike, seem to be completely down which basically caused chaos around the world. So what's your opinion on that? Yeah, so today I woke up and heard that Microsoft is broken and yeah. all of Windows uh, um, computers are, are not working. But then we got the information that actually it's not Microsoft responsible. It's the uh, CrowdStrike uh, company, which is creating um, antivirus software for many enterprise grade companies. So today, um, airports, uh, hospitals, railway stations, uh, seems kind of scary, right? Just one worldwide. bad update, you know, just half of the yes. world basically is that's, like that. that that's insane. really bad. Yeah. That's really bad, to be honest. I see that uh, stock price of CrowdStrike went down by almost nine percent, as as we now speak. Okay. Uh, so this had huge impacts on the whole world economy. And just because of the antivirus software, which is creating some uh, some error uh, on uh, Windows uh, computers, because if you had this CrowdStrike uh, software installed with the new Flow update, uh, then you had the blue screen of death error and yeah. you couldn't do anything. At least that's what people thought at first, because then on, on the internet we had some solutions how to bypass that and uh, reboot it to secure mode and uh, turn our computers on. But for some hours, many of key transportation and healthcare um, companies were just looking at blue it's screen pretty <laughs> insane how much chaos this caused around the world like all yes. the news are talking about it so that's that's a very interesting thing uh and yeah i guess uh, with this accent uh we are coming to the end of the episode uh so we've covered shad cn we've covered the new aujs and also the react compiler and um, so uh, if you guys like the format where we just share the news of the you know web ecosystem uh, just let us know in the comments uh, make sure to subscribe to our channel it helps us to grow and uh, yeah thank you for watching and see you in the next one thank you